So I guess like 10 minutes gone already. <laughs> but, all right. So yes, uh, I just wanted to kind of like introduce uh, M Plus first. Uh, Edward asked me to make sure I introduce what M Plus is before I kind of went on about this exhibition that I co-curated with Pauline Yao called In Search of Southeast Asia through the M Plus collections. So obviously M Plus, uh, if you've been there uh, in Hong Kong before, is right in front of the Kowloon station in the uh, Kowloon site opposite Central. And that's the little building over there. Okay, it's little, I guess, right now over here. This was almost a year ago when it was uh, kind of still halfway uh, building up. Uh, but today it's uh, it's almost done. Uh, the facade is almost up, and I just wanted to say that as a museum, um, I think um, it's part of a of a larger master plan called West Kowloon Cultural District. Uh, and so you could tell that that's the building here. But at the moment, we have this thing called Empire Pavilion. Called uh, it's like a lab. The lab means you get to play around with exhibitions there and work with all your other colleagues across registration and conservation and all that. Uh, so that has been going on for the last four years, uh, and I just wanted to you know roughly talk about the building itself. Uh, the whole thing is about 60,000 square meters. And so um, HDM, Herzog and Demuon is very particular about trying to create a very horizontal experience in a city where you mostly experience things very vertically. And so all the, um, all the, ex all the galleries are basically on the podium level. And so this is just a little bit of a kind of a, the whole thing. Yeah, made of four major quads. Uh, and at the moment we are preparing for an opening display that will be December 2020 next year or early 2021, and that's when we are planning to open. But of course, beyond uh, just the museum and the building itself, that's just a little bit of a interview review. Um, that's what it is today, like two weeks ago, I think. And so we all the panel, which is this very custom um, uh, ceramic facade uh, that HDM designed uh, is pretty much the skin of the building. And so the, the key thing about MPOS, I guess, it's uh, people think, okay, you're museum based in Hong Kong, but why, why a global purview? What's the point about it? And uh, how are you kind of like addressing the Asian context? And one of the very key word here is obviously visual culture, which I will address later. And hopefully with this idea of, a, so it's, it's pretty much a geographical uh, conscious project uh, because we know that they are, I guess, like what you say, uh, uh, a majority or a dominance of a particular view that is Eurocentric perhaps or America centric. And I guess what MPAS is trying to do, it's not so much about Asia centric per se, but how do you become committed to a region like Asia, but at the same time still allow for a transnational perspective and framework where, um, where you really kind of uh, address issues that are across, across different uh, sort of more rhizomatic way of uh, defining things as opposed to a very single centric way of defining things. And so, so it is rooted in Hong Kong and Hong Kong itself being a very highly specific like any other city in the world, but also at the same time between a, a nexus of the local and the global. And that's what has been informing the way we acquire and the way we also program our exhibition. So this is a, a diagram which I have used very often. It, it existed in the website early on four years ago, but now you're no longer using it, but it's still pretty much uh, essentialized. Oh, sorry, this, oh, sorry, I, I kind of like not used to mic, but we'll try. Thank you for a reminder. Yeah, so this is the diagram that we've been using to talk about how we are really looking at Hong Kong, but not so much in a centric sort of way, but a very rhizomatic sort of way. Uh, and I just wanted to highlight some of the keywords here that we are using. And so we are really looking at uh, collecting visual culture from Hong Kong, China, and other regions of Asia and the rest of the world. But then the main approach here is about looking at the global movement of ideas across time and space, and in order to reflect a multi-centered, transcultural and transnational context of today's visual culture. And so we're basically looking at Hong Kong's place in the world in order to inform uh, how we actually focus, what stories we actually focus on. And the other key word here is, of course, visual culture. Again, this is not an academic term of visual culture, and we are not uh, striving to look for a definitive term either. But visual culture for our museum is basically, uh, first of all, it started from a white paper that was written by a committee that came up with the museum's uh, concept in 2008. And if you were to just read a little bit of the paper, visual culture here is meant to mean the different disciplines from visual art, architecture, design, moving image, as well as popular culture. And so that's, that's what, uh, I guess, the defining kind of disciplines or areas or fields that we are looking at. And so at the moment, uh, there are key three disciplines that we that are that actually organize the curatorial team, but also the kind of works that we acquire. So they are visual art, DNA, and moving image. But at the same time, we are very aware of the crossover zones. And we are constantly almost uh, encouraging ourselves to see what does the crossover zone actually lead to new kind of conversations, new interpretations, and new ways of acquiring works. Uh, and so that's what we are still exploring until today. Um, and so uh, because of the interdisciplinary nature of the collection, we are both so-called, if you would account, 
the number of objects in the collection is a combination of works and items, but at the same time, we are collecting design and architecture archives, which is very difficult to count. And so there's up to about 12,000 kind of archival items from a photograph to a slide. And so it's a very diverse uh, nature of the collection itself. And so uh, just, this is just like a, an example of how if we were to address architecture and urbanism, a, a photograph by Gursky, uh, Tao Fei's animation about China, as well as this uh, furniture designer architect, Li Naihan's um, uh, wardrobe that is on the shape of CCTV by OMA, they are all meant to be really speaking about architecture in a critical way, uh, whether it's a, it's a machine for a financial machinery or even the idea of the ob architecture as object, basically. And so this is how we choose to interpret architecture through these different lenses. So this is just a very quick slide of all the programs that we've been doing since 2012, even without a building. Uh, we are very mobile and roving. Uh, and so this is a, uh, an exhibition that is in Yamate neighborhood. Uh, we've done this. This is at a site before m was actually built. Uh, it's basically trying to question what sculpture is and ephemerality for public art. Uh, and so we have um, a few works, including the, the pile uh, by Paul McCarthy. And uh, also, this is our first collection show where we showed our uh, first group of architecture collection from Hong Kong and mainland China, as well as website, web-based exhibitions on neon signs where we actually asked for a uh, kind of like a crowdsourced photographs of neon signs, but also looking at neon signs from, from the visual, uh, from the idea of popular culture, like, a, like film, Christopher Doyle, uh, but also look at graphic design, the making of it, the craft of neon signs, as well as from a visual art uh, perspective. And also, of course, the very discursive format is very important for us to really start considering uh, the different ways in which we look uh, to our building our collection. And so this is the Empire's Pavilion where we have exhibitions. Uh, I'm going to go pretty much from, yeah, these are the, some of the exhibitions that have been shown there. And I'm going to move towards this uh, exhibition that I'm going to share about, which is called In Search of Southeast Asia through the Empire's Collections. It was basically beginning last summer till the fall. Um, and, um, and it is co-curated, as I mentioned before, with uh, Pauline J. Yao, uh, lead curator of visual art, and myself. And so this is the first time that it's a co-curated interdisciplinary exhibition, because usually you look at uh, exhibitions that are like either design and architecture or visual art. But for us, when we are really looking at this exhibition, we have to almost consider what are we trying to say about what m is, but also what about the region. And so, as mentioned before, uh, it really causes us to think or rethink what place is, what is Southeast Asia, or whatever, you know, nation or or place or cities, uh, and, and how do we really took on the idea of the local, regional, and global, but transnational at the same time. So looking at specificities, but at the same time still be able to develop something that is of global or regional relevance. And the question of discipline here, again, visual culture as methodology, and so how does bringing in architecture or visual art create another layer of meaning to how we understand a place or a phenomenon? And that's something that we really strive to do. And of course, the last word here, the key word actually for our museum is the word canon. So very aware that there are existing histories, very set paradigms or meanings, or even ascribed values to what is art and what is good design architecture. And for us, we are seeking for a more inclusive and expanded set of narratives in order to rejig, I guess, what these ascribed values are. So we're not saying that we are no longer Eurocentric or whatsoever, we are Asia-centric, but we are really trying to expand this and look at as many points of reference as possible. And then the last one, of course, this is what we're trying to do. Museum is really more than a building or even more than a collection, but it's an active repository. How do we create meaning with the audience as well? So I just wanted to show a little video. Okay, how does this play? Uh, let's see. This is, oh, is there a way to play this video? It's like about, oops. Let's see, how does this work? Maybe you gotta press something. Uh, this, can you control it on the, on the laptop? <laughs> I, this, is, this is only like about 10 seconds, but it speaks of what we're trying to do. It has sound. Does it work? I am very sorry for the delay, but uh, is it? Should I just do this? I can't. <laughs> I will. Is this the way or? I'm not. Okay, I think I will just, do you want to help me try or I should just give up and just move on? Yeah, okay. All right, I'll just, I'll just move on. Oh, what, what happens? Okay, right, there, there, yeah, thank you. Just that little kind of play button and yeah.
local expertise was as competent and their design as Thank you. I, I'm really, I, that, that was a very key, we basically told our video producer, make sure it's like a radio tuner, radio tuner, like going back and forth and like nothing is really set, there's no one idea, and you just kind of move on between all your tuning. Uh, and so the idea of tuning between disciplines, tuning between uh, histories and the present state, and tuning between pretty much, yeah, archival materials, but also objects. And that's kind of like summarize the nature of the exhibition. Uh, I just wanted to show our main text, uh, again, I don't want to bore you, but just wanted to kind of focus on some of the key things. Again, some people may uh, disagree. Some people actually hated the title of the exhibition. They said, there's nothing to be in search of our Southeast Asia anymore. We have a very deep understanding of Southeast Asia and it's all set. So why do you have to exoticize it with this title? And for us, we had to, you know, it's very clear why we chose this title because we are basically choosing it not so much as an exotic kind of form that we have to keep discovering, but basically there is no end to meanings of things. And meanings are continue to be destabilized and we have to continue to find out and be curious about what are the, the new forms. And so the idea of in search for us is just really our continued curiosity and continued non-assuming stance to what a place or a region is. And I think that's what the works are meant to pretty much uh, play up, uh, different kind of meanings uh, to, to what we perceive of a region or a country. And so some of the keywords uh, here that we just said, again, one thing that I wanted to say that because we are basing uh, this exhibition on the works that are already in the collection, they are pretty much based on individual perspectives, micro histories, rather than any overarching narratives. And be able to, we want to be able to complicate the notion of a homogenous Southeast Asia. And the, the idea about Southeast Asia for us is not just a navel gazing Southeast Asia, but Southeast Asia that actually point to a wider geography and a constant conversation with places outside Southeast Asia. And so you will see how, I guess this is just kind of like the, the, the countries. Again, uh, we've only begun collecting for the last uh, four or five years uh, concertedly. And uh, I guess at the moment, the works are only able to represent uh, these countries and so it will grow but even within uh, these countries at the moment you will realize that there'll be names that doesn't come from southeast asia so that includes people like jeffrey bawa is from sri lanka paul rudolph obviously american uh, and so or even uh, the hong kong artists that we are including in the works by wilson she as well as another mountain man of stanley wong and so these are the kind of uh, way we see southeast asia as being viewed by so-called the insider or the outsider but how the outsider and the insider actually influence each other, and that's something that, that we should not exclude, basically. And so that's uh, even Bas Princeton I mentioned over here, which I'll bring up later on. And so this is uh, obviously, because it's the first time that we're doing an interdisciplinary dialogue, we don't want visual art to overwhelm architecture or the other way around. And we wanted the issues or the topics that we are addressing to be a result of a conversation between the two disciplines. And so these three uh, topics here, which is conditions of place, States and powers and transnational flows are pretty much resulting from pretty much putting all the works on the table and we realize that, okay, Pauline, I think this thing really speaks to each other in this way. And the, the topics just kind of come up based on those kind of conversations between the works. And so I just wanted to highlight that the ones in blue are the themes that are addressed by particular works. So having to do with like uh, origins or the, the search for origins, climatic or tropical regionalism, which is pretty much the way we've been acquiring uh, a lot of the works there from Southeast Asia for architecture, materiality, local archetypes, informal urbanism, under states and powers is about the colonial history of uh, Southeast Asia, post-colonial independence, uh, resistance, uh, national survival strategy as, as seen in some of the works by Charles Lim, and transnational flows just about the exchange of ideas, people and objects, but also the idea of the global artistic design language and discourse. Uh, and so these are the ways in which we chose to frame the exhibition based on the works. So as you can see, the larger section is under uh, conditions of place. It's a very small, uh, it's 300 square meters, and so this is all that we're able to display, but it kind of encapsulates how we chose to frame the region. So how we started the exhibition uh, with uh, Zai Kuning's uh, film. Uh, so Zai Kuning is a Singaporean, uh, obviously, artist, uh, but also his medium is really quite varied. And this film uh, in 2003 was really about his search for the original Malays original Malays. And so like, you know, are they Malays from Singapore? Where are they usually from? Are they really all Islamic Malay? Or is it something about the seafaring Malays that are not necessarily of any religious affinity uh, or of association, but are really just uh, kind of like a freestyle group of, uh, of people? And so for him, he's really trying to re reconsider what this identity is uh, for an ethnic group. And so that for us is it really an example of the idea of searching uh, in search of. And so just as the artists are searching for identities such, such as these, the show itself will continue to be searching for, uh, for meanings of the region and other places. And so this is just the, the first section here. And I'll just, of course, this is very familiar work. Uh, Sophie Pitch um, 
for a compound, and then later on it ends with Silver and Gill, and then it moves on to States and Powers on the left. But over here, the works here are mostly the architectural works because they are all obviously flat works. And so, and so this is just some of the ways in which we hope to have a dialogue between Sophie's uh, compound with the uh, Nia architect. Um, um, this is pretty much the, this, I guess you can say the skeleton of his very first project called Wind and Water Cafe. And his use, his choice use of bamboo as a way of not just about identity, but an ecological stance to his practice when he came back to Vietnam. Uh, and so how can these two works uh, kind of really inform each other about the importance of materiality in, in defining uh, one's practice? But also this is a work uh, by San Lee Wong in Hong Kong and how he looks at buildings that are half constructed across Southeast Asia. And this is one in, uh, in Siam Rip, it's called the Ghost House. And, and so how does that speak about the idea of observing the local or locality uh, as a, uh, compared to what Propeller Group is, lo is looking at in terms of the very deep South uh, funeral rites in deep South Vietnam? And so this is the level of locality here is of, of a different uh, degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is just a view of the kind of uh, objects uh, and drawings that are for, for the architectural material under the section. And so I'll just kind of uh, a little bit, uh, this is from Paul Rudolph to Woha to Ken Yang, as well as uh, uh, Bo Chong Yang. So just a little bit of a focus on the works that are shown. It started off with uh, photographs of houses built in the 50s and the early 60s in Malaysia and Singapore. This is before Singapore became independent, uh, when they are all under this thing called FMSA, Federation of Malaya Society of Architects. And so for them, the first thing upon independence in 1957 was to actually come up with a competition called the Ideal Home. And so the Ideal Home competition is really pushing people to use new materials, new construction methodology, but also a new way of living for an emerging class. And so these are just some of the uh, images that really show about how you can say a kind of like obviously very light frame structure of a, a like modernist language. But if you were to look closer, uh, how the building itself is enveloped, um, and it's really, really looking at uh, a kind of natural illumination, natural ventilation, but also a use of local materials in a, in a very kind of a detailed sense. And so you can see all from the drawing, the idea of the overhang, the idea of lifting it off the ground for cooling. So all of these are, are just a way in which they express identity um, just in the level of residential design. And these architects here, Woody Edwards and Partners, as well as the Malayan Architectural Partnership, form two, one, two of two very key archives in our collection uh, that are really companies or architectural firms that really shape uh, the modern, modern architecture in Malaysia as well as in Singapore. So this is a, another project. Okay, this is the project where people, what is Jeffrey Bawa doing in here? Uh, so Jeffrey Bawa, if uh, many people already know, is a Sri Lankan architect. Uh, known for his hotel resort architecture. So we chose to include this project because it was uh, before his white book was um, published in the 1980s. In the 1972, as early as that, he was already influencing what hotel design could be in Bali. Uh, that was, of course, thanks to the invitation of uh, Donald Friend, an Australian artist, as well as uh, uh, Wawaruntu, which is a developer in Bali. And this is a pretty much a master plan of what this uh, hotel resort could be. And you could tell, again, this, I wish it's like a detail. Each of this is a plot or a compound, and each is a so-called the villa, the, the, ho the hotel villa. And you can see that they're all pretty much made up of single-story pavilions that are surrounded by water bodies, and they're all really kind of uh, going towards the beach here. It's like a very, very narrow lane of a highly intimate space. And so this is very unlike all the hotels that uh, Bawa had designed in Sri Lanka. And this is pretty much uh, what I found in his archive were research photographs or study photographs of him, of his trips to Bali, about four trips between 72 and 74 uh, of all the palatial grounds, but also the very uh, kind of like everyday dwellings of Balinese and just seeing how sculpture is used and the materials, the kind of uh, volcanic stone that are being used and how the, of course, even this thing is actually the sales catalog for the resort and how he really, uh, he and Donald Fran chose to commission uh, Balinese artists uh, to be able to kind of picture what this uh, uh, group of villas could be. And these are all the studies of the kind of material that are being used for the buildings as well. And so this is a, the, yeah, this is a plan, uh, obviously, of one compound, an example where I mentioned about how the water bodies are, are really uh, separating all the single story open as well as uh, uh, enclosed pavilions for living rooms, uh, dining rooms, but also bedrooms. And this is another photograph which I thought quite fascinating. Again, this is meant like a, to be like a barn, like you kind of use, put them as storage, but then how he transformed it pretty much into the kind of like a different kind of modernity for the well-heeled uh, comfort uh, as into like a pretty much a, an open, uh, unenclosed uh, living room. And so that's the kind of transformation, I guess, what Bauer was trying to, to do just based on a, a local uh, spatial typology. And so the next one is Rudolph. Uh, again, need no little introduction, uh, but I think we were completely fascinated when we saw this uh, unbuilt project. This one, if you could see closely, 
I built, it was meant for a hotel in Singapore, but it completely spoke of what Waha is trying to do and many other architects. The idea of using the staggered volumes uh, for uh, so sun shading, but also for airflow and the idea of using a waterfall and an open kind of a space in the middle. And so it's, it's that and the idea of the, the lifted uh, ground level in order for, for uh, ventilation as well. All of these are pretty much the very basic idea of, uh, of what you can say some people call tropical skyscraper today. Uh, but this is unbuilt and obviously he de developed it further in Wisma Dharmala Sakti in Jakarta. And, uh, and I, get, I guess one interesting thing about the discourse that was happening when he was designing this was the discourse about identity and the role of cultural identity in architecture. And the client actually asked him to consider that aspect uh, in this design and yet he refused to to do it as though it's like it's just for the sake of a formal identity but actually by the rotation of floor plates he's able to create a form that is like the indigenous roofs um, of houses that happens to speak to some cultural resonance but at the same time it is completely architectonic in its uh, motivation and so that's just a, a different way is it, even as a foreign architect uh, of approaching what tropical skyscraper could be and so we got the model of uh, uh, of course ken young is a very key uh, figure uh, moment in time in the 90s when his uh, 80s and 90s when his uh, research on bioclimatic uh, skyscraper was actually coinciding also with the whole discourse of uh, cultural identity and architecture as well that is cited by Aga Khan as well as by Mimar magazine and so what he was doing here obviously uh, most of you already know his works very well but the idea of using the, the louvers for uh, according to the sun path and of course it's a very high-tech uh, form of modern language but his spiraling of gardens and the open ground floor is very much like his buildings up to today like the National Library in Singapore and so all this, I guess, yeah, you can say Woha is a very familiar work. And so the idea of the, the perforated city, the use of layering, breathing, and um, staggering, this is uh, something that had happened in uh, Woha's first uh, project that is unbuilt for public housing in Singapore called for Duxton Plain. And yet there was their first sky, uh, high rise design. Uh, it has been uh, implemented up to today in several projects. So the last section, okay, I think we're all warm and sweaty now. Um, uh, we'll try to end quick. Uh, so Satan Powers was a, a very, uh, second section is a very key one. And like, like what I mentioned before, uh, it is largely made up of the archives of uh, Buri Edwards and Partners, as well as the Malayan Architects Co-Partnership with Artworks, as well as, uh, again, this is a colonial poster. So, so I just wanted to say that how we understand states and powers here is really about how power, state power, is actually seen through colonial imperialism, through nation building efforts, as well as contemporary statecraft. And that's how we chose to be able to really talk about this topic through all the different works. And so, again, this is so-called the beautiful poster that you see and you eat your fur and all that, but really behind it is a complete exploitation of resources um, by the colonial power. So it was produced uh, for, for the tourism agency uh, in the 30s. And so we wanted to kind of bring this up as a pretext, I guess, to what uh, colonial, uh, post-colonial independence is, because Hong Kong doesn't really understand this, the nature of colonialism, I guess, in that sense. And so we needed to kind of bring this as a contrast to what it was before. And then the archive itself, this is a, a photograph of a, a very key area now. It's all high rise because it's Shenton Way, the major central business district of Singapore. But at that point in the mid 60s or 67, there was really this, this building called Singapore Conference Hall and Trade Union House by Malayan Architects Partnership and the Malaysia Singapore Airlines building. It's all by MAC as well, or Lim Chong Kiat. And so just how key buildings actually uh, is part of reflecting a rapid urban modernization, but also highly symbolic urban symbols uh, for, for this uh, bit for modernity that is uh, secular, not so much based on ethnic or religious sort of identity. And then these are the three works uh, that are from, they are not designed in architecture, but we spoke uh, to, to the topic, uh, like what I said before, the idea of uh, how the state actually controls the waterways in Singapore by Charles Lim's work. And Kiwi Delinas are kind of a reminder of the past of the martial law in the Philippines and the, uh, I guess the censorship of the suppression of free speech. Uh, but over here by Bas Prinson, uh, obviously architect and photographer, is really looking at how, again, up to today, uh, Singapore is a, a consummate uh, you know, user of, of resources to be able to build this uh, underground oil caverns uh, to store petrochemicals. And so it's, a, it's an amazing way in which a state is really being exercised, state power is being exercised uh, in, in, the, in Southeast Asia. And then the, the, the archive that is a little bit of a surprise that I found was this archive. Again, uh, not there's going to be a publication that is published soon about Moody Edwards and Partners. When we talk about post-colonial independence, uh, it's often that we talk about the local firms, the people who are homegrown, you know, the Chinese or the Malays, but we don't talk about the British colonial architects or even South African. So Buddy Edwards and Partners is an example of a colonial firm started in 19, you know, 1919, even as early as that. And then later on, uh, they changed partners to involve Chinese architects, but also still British architects. So 
the, the majority of the projects that we have acquired in this archive are pretty much from the 50s onwards. So that's very close to the independence period of 1957. But there's this person um, uh, that is called, uh, oh my goodness, I, my, 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 name, my, my mind just switched off because of the name of the person. He's a South African uh, British uh, architect. There was a, a partner of a BEP architect and he built uh, some of the design, some of the very key buildings in Kuala Lumpur. So this includes University of Malaya, completely the only use of like pure beton roof uh, brutalist project as well as a uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia's first international airport called Subang Airport uh, in KL. And so you can see the use of concrete thin shell roof as a, as a finding, defining characteristic of the airport itself, completely naturally ventilated apart from the, from the inner rooms. And, uh, and even in Brunei, uh, very major projects in Brunei that includes the Brunei State Mosque, but also completely, you can say it's a completely modernist aesthetic of a mosque. And so this is all by BEP architect that we needed to almost uh, uncover. Uh, to say that the colonial architects play just as an important role. And this archive also includes letters, uh, letters and notes uh, about the importance of discussing what does a Malayan architecture actually mean uh, at the attainment of Merdeka, which is obviously independence uh, in Malaysia. And this is really a conversation, if you were to look closer, there is people like Julius Posner, which is obviously maybe familiar to all of you. And he was the one who actually founded the Kuala Lumpur Technical College for Architecture in Malaysia. And it includes um, uh, uh, architects that are from BEP architects, all about the conversation of what is Malayan architecture and how it should not be a singular, simple, simplistic way of looking at identity and how architecture should really allow itself to develop, to develop its own identity. Uh, so this is an, a discussion that is very rare because what happens in about 15 years time from now, there's actually a policy in Malaysia that actually wants to Malayan, Malayanize architecture. So buildings have to have a form of like roof uh, in order for them to have, you know, to speak or, or to have get, get state funding. And so it's a very, it's a moment of freedom. I can say a, kind of like a liberal moment when many expressions are possible. And so with this, uh, at that moment, uh, this is also by BP Architects. So this is a, a house for the Sultan of Brunei, uh, based in Kuala Lumpur then, using this anodized aluminum uh, roof. And then uh, another project, which is called uh, Kuala Lumpur Hilton. And this is in 19, 1968 to 1972, a major tourist project uh, for, for Malaysia. But if you see over here, uh, this is basically the drawing that shows the much more defined Minang Kabau inspired roof uh, made up of bronze anodized aluminum again um, for, for the lobby entrance uh, to really speak of that moment of what is Malayan architecture. But this is the days before it became uh, kind of like formalized by the government itself, but people were exploring these aspects. So for us, it's not so much about an aesthetic that we agree on, but it's about what does the design actually meant in terms of uh, affecting or shaping discourse at the time. And so this is just a, an example uh, view of the, of the archival table for Malayan Architects Co-Partnership. Uh, so everything from photographs to booklets to posters about uh, Development Bank of Singapore Tower, but also this uh, very key model of the mosque uh, in Seremban, built in 67. So I just wanted to, and so these are just some of the very key projects. Again, uh, Malayan Architects Co-Partnership is very different um, from a lot of um, firms in M Malaysia. They are very critical of any form of single, singular way of Malayan modernism but really focus on architecture as a form of like social and technological progress. And so you could see that in their, in their buildings. Uh, to them, the idea of modernism or modernity here is about openness, public access, transparency, where people are able to access this building that are meant to be very public. It's Singapore's first uh, conference hall and everything to, uh, of course, uh, this one is the Jurong Town Hall, um, uh, which is after today is still the major uh, landmark in, in the industrial uh, sector of, uh, of Singapore and how this is a really this kind of monumental heroic sort of architecture uh, but at the same time without reducing to any sort of a nativistic kind of like symbols and then this is again can you believe it this is city people think it looks like city hall in Boston but it's actually a bank for uh, Bagnagara Malaysia and Penang and so this is all done by MAC in, in the early uh, mid 60s and this mosque itself completely uh, subverted what mosque uh, architects should be. Uh, there's no use of, um, of a, a single minaret. Uh, the minaret itself is really on, uh, through all this uh, roof, uh, this floating roof by the hyperbolic uh, parabolic roof. And so, uh, and this is also Oak Arab uh, engineers first project in Southeast Asia and how Lim Chong Kiat really invited them to be part of this project to show how the design of a mosque deserves just as much attention as a skyscraper for engineering, uh, as an engineering feat. And so this is the last section, transnational flows, a very key one for us uh, because uh, we really don't think that our, there, are, there are always artists and designers and architects in Southeast Asia who do not call themselves Singaporean or Malaysian or Southeast Asian. They, they want to see themselves as being part of a global discourse and they are engaging, uh, engaging with a, a wider uh, concept uh, kind of uh, practice, conceptual practice. And so 
uh, some of these works, uh, but of course, before we go there, uh, we included two works by, by uh, one work by uh, Hong Kong art called Wilson Shi. This is actually a reminder of Hong Kong being part of Southeast Asia before uh, mainland China opened up. And so if you watch Wong Kar Wai's films, a lot of the films are actually to do with uh, Hong Kong's relationship uh, with, uh, with Cambodia, with uh, Malaysia, and with the tropics. And so he's just really painting, uh, illustrating the, the scenes that are from the movies, uh, just to remind people of what Hong Kong was at that point in relation to that region. And of course, there's another uh, work here, not by, you know, not set in Burma per se, uh, in Myanmar per se, but BDZ is a Myanmar-born Taiwanese director. And uh, this film is set in Kaohsiung, but in Kaohsiung itself, there are many migrant workers that are from Thailand, Cambodia, as well as Myanmar. And the film itself is about loss and about longing and, um, and also about uh, identity. And so this is uh, another aspect of this section will be the idea that uh, method, the methodology that is taken by, sorry, yes, time's up, okay. Methodology taken by the, art, the artists and the architects themselves are already meant to kind of break the borders. They are meant to be borderless. And so Sumen Junsai is a very key architect for us from Thailand that we acquired uh, um, also about the same time that really speaks to how he is engaged in the language of modern architecture and postmodernism as well. And so we could tell that, uh, again, I just want to say these are the, the works that speak to that global borderlessness as a kind of methodology. And uh, just to focus on uh, Sumet Jumsai's work, uh, again, Sumet Jumsai uh, really wants to play with the idea of the, what does it mean for the, uh, for the human, uh, Corbusier's term about human and the machine. Uh, and so like how does a machine itself, for him, the machine is more than a metaphor, but the machine itself could be something that is humanized by, by shaping it into a recognizable form of a toy kit for a building that he designed for the British Council, but also a robot toy that is uh, belonging to his son for a bank that was uh, in the dawn of uh, digital banking. And so this is the first, uh, business, uh, first uh, building, a high rise in the uh, Sathon district uh, in Thailand, in Bangkok. And so for him, it's really a kind of embrace and critique of postmodernism uh, or the arbitrary form of appropriation of classical features. Uh, but in fact, uh, looking at it as a, as a form of like, so how far can I push the idea of digital or the, or the machine, I guess, in a building? And so another uh, group of archives that is very key for us is Buckminster Fuller's Interaction with Southeast Asia. This is in the last 10 years before he passed away in 1983. And it's mostly through the archive of Sumet Jumsai as well as Lim Chong Kiet, uh, because these are people that he had really become friends with, but also whose ideas are pretty much uh, resonating with each other. And for us uh, to include this archive is not so much about idolizing a hero figure, but really about but emphasizing a multi-directional influence, a mutually reinforcing kind of influence between uh, Bucky Fuller, but also between uh, with the architects in Thailand and Malaysia, Singapore. So these are the, the kind of meetings that they organize together called the Champuan. Champuan also means a confluence of a river of meeting uh, of, of different ideas uh, that are in Bali and using bamboo to, both, uh, to build the dome and all that. And so, and this is just a picture of uh, Baki, Sumen Jumsai, Lim Chong Kiet. Uh, really in this book over here, Critical Path, if you were to read it, uh, Critical Path's uh, preface or the first chapter is pretty much based on all his visits in Southeast Asia about the terrace party fields. And this really expands the idea of the, the new maritime history of, uh, of, of the, of the world uh, that really uh, used as, as that. But then at the same time, uh, uh, Baki's ideas also influenced uh, Sumat Jumsai's uh, work, especially his book called Naga. So they have been uh, both uh, um, researching on the idea of the hydraulic uh, towns as well as the maritime uh, kind of life and history of, of Southeast Asia. And so both are really influencing each other. This is just the notes that we have included in the exhibition, uh, but also how the idea of the home itself is really more Oh, sorry, more than a replication of forms, but it's about really looking at a kind of like a way of uh, uh, considering what is eff true efficiency of building. And so these are kind of, uh, so I just wanted to end with two works uh, that we thought we could include, but we couldn't because we couldn't get to our pass in time. Uh, Archigram's uh, project for Eastern Malaysia in Commonwealth Institute, a very key way in which we can consider almost the, the colonial construction of Malayan uh, identity. Uh, and how it is still seen as a very tropical, you know, it's tropicality itself, uh, uh, a kind of like a fixed identity uh, that is considered by, by Archigram or these British architects, right? So they actually form a, a climate simulated uh, room in order to uh, mimic what it means to be in Malaysia. So again, it sounds fun, but at the same time, it is criticized by being or reducing Malaysia into kind of like a tropical forest. And then another project, just wanted to end with this. Uh, so this is an example of how, uh, as a designer and architect curator, we actually acquire works by artists that speaks to a phenomenon of urbanism uh, in Bangkok. And this is uh, based on the exhibition called Cities on the Move, a very key exhibition. And so this is a, a cover art that is unpublished uh, to be part of a set of illustration for a comic book by Navin and Rick Ritt. And so the reason why we acquired it is because it's about a battle between a robot building by Sumer Junsai 
and the Louis the Fourteenth building. They call it Louis the Fourteenth. So these buildings are basically products of so-called postmodern architecture in Thailand uh, uh, due to the economic boom and bust. And so this is completely uh, symbolizing the de nouveau riche taste. But then uh, in the end, uh, this story uh, again is a, is a comic strip, uh, a romantic plot about a person who is transported to, to the year two five four two and found out that his girlfriend got kidnapped by a building uh, with a Medusa. And it's in the Louis XIV uh, building. And at that point, the iconic robot, robot building was still alive, but it's dead, it's not moving. And so the hero, uh, the hero had to let his blood in order to make a robot building come alive and pretty much uh, use it. So there's the bloodletting moment. Uh, use it to operate as a, as a robot to kill the Medusa, right? So in the end, of course, the victor is the robot building. And this is just a moment for that. And then it ends with a lovely story of, uh, of, yeah, of the victor uh, moving to Helsinki for the last stop of uh, Cities on the Move. And so for us, we acquired this because it's a very interesting how artists are captured, uh, 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 how buildings capture the imagination of artists uh, and how urbanism itself is spoken of. Uh, Bangkok is not just a city of problems, but a city of hyper-potentiality. And that's something that we would like to kind of go into. So I'm very sorry for going over time. Uh, but that's the way uh, we acquire NEPOS. And hopefully by next December or early 2021, you guys are welcome to come by. Thank <laughs> you.